Jorge. Hey, Peter, how are you? Okay. Good. Can you see me? I can see you and I can hear you. How is Excellent. That? That's good. Everything good with you? Everything is great. That's good. And uh, <laughs> new UDO record, Touchdown. Um, you guys happy with it? Absolutely. I mean, it's it's it was a lot of work. You know, I wasn't involved that much. I was involved in the songwriting, so I just played the bass. But the band is very happy uh, in the charts all over the world. It uh, entered Germany at number four. It's the highest charting album of Udeo ever. I have nothing to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're part of it. You play bass, so you yeah. know a part of you is in it. And uh, how did it come about for you to play again with uh, Udo? Um, he called me last year. You know, he was it was September actually, and he it was Sven who called and said. Uh, we're on the road. We started a big tour of three months. And on the second day, the bass player collapsed on stage. He was very ill. And uh, I haven't been playing since 2018. And he asked, it was Tuesday. He said, you, is there any way you can help us out? And I said, oh, how? He said, well, you have to learn 16 UDO songs. We can play some except songs. And you have to be in Berlin on Friday to go on stage. Well, I live in Florida. So it's Tuesday. I had to learn the songs. I was learning on the plane. And then basically on, on Friday, I was in Berlin and played. <clears throat> and the rest is history then. How was that first show? You know, it's like, uh, you know, like riding a bicycle. It was just... Nah, it's, it's, they always say that. But, you know, it was, it was an old rusted bike that was, you know... Uh, I was nervous. I was nervous for several reasons. A, you know, I, these were songs I didn't know. You know, I wasn't I wasn't confident in my playing. Uh, that's number one. Number two was a band I never met. And uh, then it was Udo, you know. <clears throat> so all of a sudden I'm, I'm there with Udo. But uh, I have to say it was the first minute Udo walked on stage. And when he started singing, he looked over at me and we played. It really felt familiar, like the old days. So that gave me confidence and made me feel good. And then, you know, every day it progressed. But uh, in the end, it worked out. But I was it wasn't like riding a bike now. <laughs> and, you know, if you want to talk, not to go into detail, obviously, but um, you left Accept because you were just tired of everything that was going on you didn't want to be there anymore well you know you know the i mean everybody knows now i mean i, I did a lot of interviews and i don't, really don't want to talk about it anymore but basically it's it's um you know it we used to grow up as a as a band as friends and stuff and then these things change you know business business wise and music wise and then it always seems that somebody wants all the influence, all the, you know, it's, it's once you're not involved anymore in the decision making, what's the point? Yeah. So I'm not interested in that. So I left. And now, you know, I'm in a, <clears throat> it's, it's a unique situation because here uh, uh, in this band, I'm very much respected. It's really nice. Uh, they're very respectful. There's no egos, you know, that's very new for me there's new egos in this but Udo doesn't care he's 71 years old you know he's just happy to sing yeah and that's that's a good foundation for uh, for a band because you know he supports all the young players in the band and uh, it's really relaxed you know the music is the number one issue in the band it's not the business that much you know yeah. so that just runs automatically and <clears throat> for me it was literally like the joining the band was like really for my um, own happiness. Yeah, you know, I want to play. I want to make people happy. I like playing my bass. It wasn't so much a business decision. Then it was like a, I'm helping Udo out, and then he asked me. Uh, I think we were in uh, South America, and he got an email or a text from his old bass player, and he said, "I don't want to be in the band anymore." <clears throat> so now they were stuck, and they asked me if I want to stay, and I said, "Sure." Why not? It's a lot of fun. Yeah. You know, I think playing in a band is probably like a, any other job. If you're not happy, you know, you need to change things. And I, I, I feel like, uh, you know, it's really about happiness. And, you know, like 
for me, I, I'm a photographer. I like to shoot concerts. I don't like to feel like uh, it's an obligation because when I feel it's like when it becomes like a real, real job, you know, the fun is lost. And when yeah. I'm not having fun shooting, you know, there's no point in being there. You know, it's just, yeah. it's, uh, you know, I I think music is fun, you know, and when, when lawyers start to get, you know, yeah. in the yeah. business side, it's just, you know, I'm out. I don't want anything to do with this. That's pretty much true, though. I mean, it is. It's, you know, and in order to be creative and in a good spirit, you, you have to feel good about what you're doing. And that's the number one reason you're doing it in the first place that you started you know if you go back when you were really little and how you started it was just a love for music yeah you know you had no idea how good you were if you ever had talent that didn't that all didn't matter because you just worked hard on it and uh that's where you ended up and then you know i had a, a lot of fans right you know if, uh, why does he leave the mighty expect to accept and join the, the little udo udo and they just don't get it yeah <clears throat> you know it's it's it doesn't matter. It really does not matter. Yeah. I, I think, you know, for me, you know, again, like when I'm shooting shows, I, I don't do it for the money because it really doesn't pay. And if, right. <laughs> and when he used to pay, it wasn't that well paid. So yeah. I have a main job to to pay, you know, for my bills. And then I do, right, right. you know, photo for, for the fun of it. And, right. you know, I really enjoy the freedom of doing it and again if it's not fun if people say no no you have to go do this and i'm like no you know no yeah, i get that i get that absolutely and you know listening to the record touchdown you know one of the the songs is the fight for your right uh it's just one of those you know it sounds it's classic audio accept, especially with yeah. that classical part in the yeah. way through the song. And it's a it's one of those really feel-good tracks. Yeah, it is. You're, you're right. You're right. You know, I was driving today and I was listening to to the album and that song, you know, played. And I was, you know, I was smiling listening to it. <laughs> You know, it's interesting. It it has um, it has that feeling to it, and it gives you that feeling. Yet the message of the song, you know, uh, uh, it's a real somber one. It's 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 you know, fight for your right. But what what the band was saying, you know, I wasn't involved, but we talked about it a lot and and realized, <clears throat> you know, not here, but you in Europe. You know, you thought you would never have a war. You would never see a war in Europe again. Yeah. Because it's 2024, 23, you know, that's too stupid. Yeah. And yet there it is. And it made us think, you know, that in a way, it's never the people. People all over the world, Russians, Ukrainians, Germans, Danish, it doesn't matter what it is, Spanish, Italian, Mexican, Japanese, they all want the same. They yeah. want to have a family. They want to have a home. They want to be able to provide. They want to their children to have a better life. That's all they want. Yeah. And yet it's the politicians and the, uh, you know, the big businesses, the, uh, they're constantly, constantly, you know, fuck this world up. Yeah. And in a way, the song is about that people need to fight for the right to live in peace, Yeah. which is an interesting thought because all we have, you have a right to vote, but that's it. Yeah. <clears throat> From that, after that moment on, you just have you're you're just a witness to something, so you know we need to we need to take more of an action. We need to be involved. You know, if if it's go on the street and demonstrate, we have to make our voices heard and fight for the right. That's what that is about. Yeah, you have to fight for you the know? right to be happy, and that's all we want at the end. For the you have to right, fight for the right to be happy and to live in peace, to yeah. not be disturbed or, or exploited, which yeah. you know most of the time we are. Yeah, it's, yeah, you know, the world, like after a couple of years of pandemic, like with lockdowns and everything, we thought, yeah. you know, okay, it's over, you know, let's enjoy. And all of a sudden we get to war and, yeah. you know, there goes the quiet or the, you know, 
we wanted to breed because those two years were very tough for everyone. Yeah. yeah. And then the war comes up and, you know, we still don't have any, you know, we check the news and it's, you know, every day it's the same shit. Something happens, you know, it's even the interest rates now in Europe that's, you know, increased mortgage, uh, you yeah, know, yeah. People cannot afford, you know, I'm suffering from that because my my mortgage just doubled, you know, in a in a space of you know less than a year. And you know, it's crazy. I mean, we can cannot... it's also it's also the uncertainty because yeah. you know, you have a war in Europe, which right now is only two countries. And there's a there's an absolute possibility that this will change. Yeah. At any given moment, I mean, you know, everybody knows this, and to live under this this cloud, this burden, what's on your shoulders, it's very difficult to, to go on. And we, you know, now we're kind of immune to the war. You know, when you hear something in the beginning, it was a lot of outrage and heartbreak, and now, and that's always what what's dangerous when it becomes normal. It's just there, yeah. you know. But anyway, it's back to music. Yeah, and uh, you know, touchdown. <laughs> I was surprised for the for the title because you know, obviously, <clears throat> touchdown is more of a f- American football thing than <laughs> a European football kind of a thing. Uh, obviously, you live in Florida, so you are used to the NFL. The season just started now, actually this uh, this weekend. Do you follow yep. the NFL? Are you? Nope. <laughs> no, no, I. Uh... I follow soccer because we have Lionel Messi is playing here now and into yeah. Miami, and I, I don't live far from Miami. Um, but no, actually, it came about, we were waiting for a, a plane at a airport. I think it was Brazil. We were sitting in sort of a sports bar waiting for a couple of hours, and there was a <clears throat> football game on, and they touched down, touched down, and uh, Udo said, I want this. That, that, that sounds great for an album. I want this. And so I expl- he said, you know, what are the rules for this stupid game? And I tried to explain is that there's an offense and there's a defense. And the offense is trying to break through the defense, cross the line, and that's called a touchdown. And then we, we started talking and he said, you know, that kind of makes sense because they had so many setbacks for this album because it was recorded during the pandemic. They were sending tracks back and forth during the time uh, Sven's house was flooded in Germany. He lost his whole studio. Half his house was, uh, you know, destroyed. Andre was stuck in Ukraine. He had to flee with his family, mm-hmm. just with, with a bag. They had to get him out nine hour driving at night to the Polish border. And he had, uh, uh, he had missiles flying to the house next to him. So he's a refugee kind of yeah and so there were a lot of hurdles you know the album was to be supposed to be out a year earlier but because of the pandemic so it it was a tough thing and i said in a way it is a touchdown because you overcame all this and out of it comes the album touchdown and you know like i said it has the highest chart position audio ever had it has I mean, we have reviews from everywhere around the world. It's running on American radio. You know, it's it's probably safe to say that's one of the best albums the band ever produced. Yeah. And yet it was produced and done under these circumstances. So, you know, it shows you sometimes when, there, when there's a hardship and when you really have to buckle down to get something done, the best, your best work is, is you know, comes out. Yeah. Yeah, do you do you like to work under pressure? <laughs> I kind of do. I actually kind of do. I do, except when I did the bass for this album because yeah, I had time, and uh, you know they they asked me, please give us Peter Baltus. Don't don't try to you know nothing else. So it was nice for me. You know, I have my studio here, and I I had the tracks, and I uh, I went piece by piece and try to find the best possible thing that would fit and yet still is me and all that and then you know when i had one song finished all the pieces together i would put on two new tracks and uh, learn the song like play for a couple of hours and then the next day when i was confident enough i would play the whole song in one go 
with all the little mistakes and nuances, and I left that yeah. to give it a feel that, you know, it's me playing live. It's not me on Pro Tools making little bits and pieces and sticking it together. That's yeah. easy. <clears throat> I wanted to understand the song. I wanted to, you know, the challenge of, all right, if I would play live now, I have to play the whole song. I can't say stop. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's why that's what I try to create. And that worked out very well. You know, everybody was really happy. And uh, so in that case, the pressure was off. Yeah. But usually I like pressure. Yeah. And, uh, you, you know, obviously having your own studio makes everything easier for you when it comes to, you know, with technology now, there's a lot of, you know, plugins and stuff like that, that's, uh, you know, very helpful for musicians to, you know, create music and have all the effects, you know, with just, uh, you know, on a computer instead of having physical stuff. How do you right. prefer to to work? You still have like the analog amps and everything, you know, mic'd up and <laughs> the bass. How do you prefer to, you know, digital or still very much an analog kind of guy? Um, it, it would be economically impossible nowadays to do an album where you actually log SVT, Ampeg, and Marshall Cabins and have it all mic'd up. It's just time consuming and costs a lot of money. So we have, you know, we have our campers, you know, where you have, I have my extra sound. That was my sound. It's in there in a digital form. I plug in and there it is. You know, and uh, I can control it and so forth. So I have to say it's 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 okay. You know, we're living, we're also living in a time where maybe ninety nine percent of all people consumers somehow listen to the record something in their ear. Yeah, very rarely you have you know people have put a record on have a <laughs> big speakers and it. You know, so most of the time the music is consumed via straight into the ear. Yeah, whatever that is, and uh, so the the aspect of having that massive sound and all is get lost anyway because it's so compressed. Yeah, you know, to make it so. Uh, from that standpoint, I would say it's okay to live in the digital world. You know, it, yeah. it makes things easier. It allowed us to even make this record. Yeah, we wouldn't been able to because you could send files. Yeah, but we we already talked about the next record that we really all of us. We want to try something different. We're going to go lock ourselves into a studio in a facility, you know, with recording everything in it. Nowadays, you can bring your own recording stuff wherever you want to go. Yeah. And uh, lock ourselves in for four weeks, you know, and have a little hotel. And then we just basically work, work, work and try to create something as humans together in a room. Yeah. <clears throat> so that'll be a challenge. <laughs> for the young guys, they never done this, <laughs> but uh, I think it could be very beneficial. Yeah, so you'll have more input on the next record in in the sense of being there and you know giving your ideas, your input as an ex experienced and seasoned musician, which you know it's important even for you know obviously Sven is a young guy but already very experienced. The other two young guitar players you know, they probably will benefit from that experience as well. And you can probably transmit something that you learn throughout the years that no one thought you, but experience. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm telling you, uh, and that goes both ways. You know what I mean? I, I I was trying to learn and get better. And, you know, since I've been in this band, it's a great opportunity because these young players, they come from a different world. They listen to different bands, different music. They they play differently. <clears throat> so um, I pick this up. And, you know, sometimes I adjust myself or I learn, oh, that's cool what they're doing. I didn't, never thought about this, you know. And they do the same in yeah. return. And the only constant is Udo, which kind of you know, stays the same, which is great. <clears throat> and it gives us, allows us the space to uh, experiment. Yeah. And, and go to places, you know, like Touchdown is an interesting song because it's, you, you think it's a fast song, and yet all of a sudden it, 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 it's a mid-tempo chorus. Yeah. But it fits and it works. I would have never done that. Yeah. Young guys do that because they, they think differently. So we all benefit from that. Yeah. yeah. 
That's cool. And, uh, you know, what are the, the touring plans? You know, you guys are going to be busy for a few weeks. Yeah, we're, we're still in the festival season, but we have to finish that out. Um, it's going to finish out here in October. And then from there, we fly to the United States. And our first show is um, in the U.S. is uh, November 4th. And then the U.S. tour will take us to the middle of December. And then as I heard... The touchdown tour in Europe will start the first week of February. Okay. And that goes till the end of April or something. And then the festivals are good. And then we have to go to South America, Japan, Australia, and then, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and on and on and on and on and on. But it's good to be busy like that and, you know, to be be able to do something that you enjoy. You know, most of it. Because you you guys seem to, to be having fun together. And you I think that shows on the record as well. Yeah, it does. And it's also on stage. And it's not just us. I mean, it seems like the fans are really embracing whatever this new, the new band that, you know, that I'm in it. And, uh, you know, there's, there's moments on stage where Udo puts his arm around me, or I put my arm around him or something. And then I can see in the faces of the, the older fans, you know, there's a certain happiness and, and relief and thank you, you know, all that. So <clears throat> it's it's very much uh, appreciated that yeah. we're up there and playing. And I appreciate the fans still coming out, you know, at the same age. Yeah, but they bring their kids. So that's cool. <laughs> so a lot of young kids in the show yeah yeah that's good and uh, you know obviously a lot of of the talk that's being these days is about you know artificial intelligence how we can be used in music um do you have any fears of any kind when it comes to ai taking over music or you think it's just one of those things people talk a lot about but in the end you know especially for rock and metal you'll need real people to make it <laughs> I think in in pop and dance music, it's probably very easy to utilize. Um, metal and rock, there's still two genres that you need the life experience. So when you go to a rave party, it really doesn't matter who stands up there. It's yeah. just the music comes out and whoever made it, nobody cares. In <clears throat> You know, the fans that we have, they come prepared, they come with a mission, they wear appropriately, yeah. either black or the vest, and then they, they show their colors, they show their, you know, where they come from, who they are. And uh, for that time, that, that hour and a half or two or three hours, whatever it is, uh, everybody goes back to the 80s. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and loves it. And then the next day goes back to work. This I don't think that will change. Yeah, you know that will not change. And that that it looks to me that's something they're passing on to their children. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it will it will it will keep this the genre alive and the influence of AI. I think is going to be minimal in in you know in in our genre. Yeah. I, I, you know, I think that that life, you know, the experience that, you know, what you live and when you write a song, you know, about your life experience and or a story that you imagine, you know, that cannot, when you're singing and you're playing it, you know, a, I don't think AI will ever be able to have that feeling input in in it. You know, the same when you go to a live show, you know, the energy that the band that's there with the, you know, the sound and the singer right in front of you screaming, you know, all the sweat, you cannot replace yeah. that. You will never yeah. replace that. <laughs> no, and that's part of the experience, you know, it's, it's, that's why metal concerts, nobody sits, you don't sit, <laughs> you don't have a little drink, you know, you don't. Yeah, you have a big beer. I mean, there's a difference, you know. All these things are bigger and wetter and dirtier, and that's just the way it is. Yeah, and for you as a musician, you know, what was the moment that changed you, and that you realized, like, I want to be in a rock band? And there was no moment, actually. Honestly, I, 
I, I just, I remember picking up a broken guitar, repaired it. It had to be glued. I learned how to play guitar and then a couple of friends. It's always the same story. A couple of friends play guitar. One, somebody had to be a bass player. So we had little sticks. I got the shortest one. All right. I'll play bass. And it was a blessing in my life. You know, it's, it's um, you know, I mean, I always thought, you know, where, where will it take me back then? But that it actually took me all around the world or that people say he, you, you're you the hardest hitting right hand in metal, that you get like some sort of a name or something. You don't think about that. You know, all you think about is, am I good enough? And how about the five people came to the show then that next time it's 10 people and it's 15, you know, so it's such a gradual process. Yeah. I think when we went to America with balls to the wall, that I think that was the first time that we were introduced to, wow, this, how big this is. And we played with Kiss, you know, yeah. 15,000 people every night for, for three months. So then you realize where this can go. Yeah. Before, no, we were just doing the same thing we did before, just every day. <laughs> yeah. Did you learn anything from that Kiss tour that you guys did in the US? Oh, yeah, we learned, we learned a lot. They were very um, professional in every aspect, you know, it was a huge show and the band would not hang after the show. There was a limousine waiting. They, they had a bathrobe right in, right to the hotel, right to shower dinner. It was, you know, it, it wasn't the rock star life that, that when we toured with Motley Crue, we saw the other side. <laughs> so uh, a very professional approach, uh, very intelligent. You know, Gene Simmons, a very intelligent man, is a good salesman. Yeah. And uh, but the 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 everyday things that the crew did, you know, how they had everything set up. I mean, we copied everything, you know, just to learn how can we be efficient. Because even then, being efficient, even being kissed back then, you know, they saved money. They made sure they didn't just waste every penny. You know, they had the biggest show on earth, but in the back of it, you know, everything was very efficient. Which made sure they, you know, had just announced enough trucks not an extra truck cost more money it was gene simmons involved so <laughs> that money had to go in his pocket yeah <laughs> <clears throat> so you know these things we learned and uh, along the way you know they they stuck with us yeah. For, you know from that period you know obviously the 80s were like a big era you know for metal for for rock music in that in that sense you, you talked about the tour with kiss motley crew but what was the best you know tour that you guys did back in that in that era one that you know obviously you said the kiss one was you know a really good learning experience but you know from that decade what was the one that really you know made an impact on you that was really really that you guys enjoyed a lot <laughs> i mean we we were i was 20 so we enjoyed it all believe me <laughs> that that's you know we had we had the honor I mean, think about back what, who we were. We were little unknown kids from Germany who didn't speak English and never been on an airplane. They fly you to New York. We did we did the KISS tour and went right after on the Aussie tour, oh. you know. So um, we did tours with Dio. You know, we, we had the honor to play with Ronnie James Dio, we see him on stage every night. We did a huge tour with Iron Maiden, Judas Priest. So... <clears throat> To me today, I look back and it's just, it's literally an honor to, you know, share the stage with, with all these uh, massive bands that, and each one, you know, <clears throat> we had to make a mark. We had to fight hard, you know, because when you're an opening band, you have to fight. Yeah. That's it. And uh, that's the one thing we did really well. We fought as hard as you can get. And we had one good weapon that was a song called Balls to the Wall. And another one that was called Fast as a Shark. And another one that was called Metal Heart. And another one that was called Restless and What. We had a little arsenal that yeah. we could use. And uh, it did as well yeah. over the years. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, after so many years, it's still fun to be on a tour bus, fly, and... Mm -hmm those in-between shows, uh, days, it's still fun? Uh, it is, actually, because, you know, the tour buses nowadays are 
very nice, I have to say. I mean, the double decker buses and everything, very not luxurious, but you know, beautiful. Um, <clears throat> I get to say it, sit with Udo, and we talk about the old days where you know, time goes by fast. The shows are great, you know, we really enjoy Udo the most, I think, <laughs> because. <clears throat> He's been doing it for so long, but yet in his end stretch, it becomes even more special. It seems to me that every show he does, <clears throat> in a way, you could think it could be his last, mm -hmm. but it's not. And you look at the Stones, they just come up with a new album, so life goes on. Yeah. Um, Scorpion's doing fantastic. Yeah. Woody just turned 75 years old. So... There's a different appreciation, a different level of appreciating what you do, that you even have the opportunity, that you're even allowed, that you're even there. And after 40 years, or almost 50, you're still there, and there's people still there singing your songs. I mean, that's, yeah. that's incredible. Yeah. So it doesn't get old, no. <laughs> cool. Very good. Peter, thank you very much for your time. You know, all the best for a touchdown. Okay. Hopefully that will bring you guys to Portugal because, you know, uh, you've been here with accept, but you know Udo hasn't been here, and we need to find a way to bring you guys here. Okay, so. <laughs> hey, check check out my my son's band, Howling Giant. Okay, they're from Nashville, Tennessee. It's a three piece stoner band, and they're coming on a big European tour in in I think it's October. So I'm not sure they're going. They're doing five shows in Italy. I'm not sure if they come to Portugal, but check them out. And if you like them. You know, contact the label, see if you want to do an interview with them. They need all the help they can get. Would you do that for me? I will do my that. Son, my I son will. is the bass player, and they're called Howling Giant. Howling Giant. I will have yes. a check, and, uh, you know, if I'm sure I'll contact them anyway to see if okay. they'll Thank be you. within that, all right? Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Have a great day. Bye-bye. See you guys soon, all right? Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.